Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Susan Checkout Lusignan, Director of Marketing and Program Development for the Friends and Foundation of the Rochester Public Library. FFRPL raises funds, presents programs, supports special projects, helps to create specialized spaces, and purchases supplemental materials and equipment for the Rochester Public Library. We welcome you back to Book Sandwiched In. We have a wonderful lineup this season, and of course, we are absolutely delighted to be back here for this in-person program. We ask that you please silence your cell phones at this time. Our thanks go to those who help fund programs like these through FFRPL, the dedicated FFRPL committee members who curate and organize these events, our guest speakers and artists who so graciously share their time and talents with us, the library staff who help with our setup and production, and the thousands of people who attend each year. A bit of housekeeping, we are continuing to require advanced registration for BSI throughout this spring. We email the registration links to our subscribers and we also post it to our website at ffrpl.org where you can sign up to receive our e-newsletters if you aren't already on our list. And of course, you can call or email us if you need assistance registering. We'll keep an attendance list each week so you do not need to print or bring your tickets and we'll continue to limit capacity and have socially distanced seating. Masking is now not required at the library at this time. We will continue to post the videos to the RPL YouTube channel at Rochester Public Library New York shortly after each review. To access the induction loop in the auditorium, we ask you to set your hearing aid to the T switch. And we thank you for helping to make it possible for us to present in-person events while keeping everyone safe during the ongoing pandemic. Today's review is of the secret history of home economics, how trailblazing women harnessed the power of home and challenged the way we live. And the book is by Danielle Drellinger. Since we always try to share information on relevant library resources, we wanted to be sure that everyone here today knew that you could use your library card to borrow brother sewing machines from Central Library's art division, and several sewing machines, as well as other similar supplemental materials, were purchased with support from FFRPL. And of course, we have those as uh, visual aids for you here on the podium. You can also borrow craft kits from the arts division. The thematic craft kits include knitting books, knitting needles, looms, and other related items. Each kit circulates for eight weeks and can be placed on hold. And finally, we wanted you all to know that you can also borrow VIP passes to the National Susan B. Anthony Museum and House, and you could take those out with your library card. And those are good for two people on weekends or four people on weekdays. Reservations are required. You get those at the circulation desk, so we hope you'll take those out as well. Our reviewer today is Deborah Hughes, the president and CEO of the National Susan B. Anthony Museum and House, which was the home of the legendary American civil rights leader and the site of her famous arrest for voting in 1872. The house was the headquarters of the National American Women's Suffrage Association when Anthony was its president, and also where Susan B. Anthony died in 1906 at age 86, following her failure is impossible speech in Baltimore. Deborah Hughes has been president and CEO of the museum and house since 2007. During her tenure, the Anthony Museum has completed a major phase of restoration to the National Historic Landmark, secured its absolute charter as a museum, and dramatically grown attendance while staying true to its mission and vision. Hughes has also spearheaded innovative programming and events, such as the award-winning Vote Tilla, which celebrated women's suffrage along the Erie Canal. Please join me in welcoming Deborah Hughes to our podium. Thank you so much. I have to say, I owe a debt to the Friends of the Public Library because two of the best books I've read in the last 10 years have been books they've asked me to review. And I think that this is one of them. Now, it's helpful for me. How many of you have actually read the book yet? Okay, that's good. You can keep me on track then, but most of you, I can get away with some things. <laughs> First of all, 
I have to tell you my relationship with home economics. I'm from the Robin Morgan era, which is uh, in the later chapters in the book, when home economics was determined to be anything but feminist because home economics was the class that girls had to take so that you could learn how to be a wife and mother. And boys got to take wood shop. Now, somewhere between 1971, when I got sent home from school because I wore pants, and 1973, when I got to enroll in wood shop, home ec was no longer absolutely required. Now, Woodshop and Home Ec were taught at the same period, so you couldn't do both, possibly. And clearly to me, I was never going to make it as a homemaker or a wife, and I didn't want to participate in that archaic system of taking home economics. So I didn't. Today, I asked one of the women that I work with, who's a few years younger than I am. I think she was born the year of September 11th. And her comment was, I said, well, what's home economics? And she said, I don't know. Would that be where like, you'd lose, you learn to fill out your checkbook? <laughs> it's not even a part of her vocabulary, which was so fascinating to me. Now, I have to tell you, I loved woodworking so much, I took four years of woodworking. Well, thanks to Drillinger, I now understand that woodworking is home economics learning how to use tools and produce things and solve problems and the engineering and the science and the skill set is exactly what home economics is all about. I also have to tell you one of the things that I didn't learn in home economics was I didn't learn how to prepare an appropriate menu, which wasn't a problem for years. I worked. I actually got a job in a sandwich shop so that that provided really good food with excellent nutrition at an affordable cost if I didn't get too much of the soft serve ice cream. But when I graduated from the Divinity School and I had my first associate pastor job making less money than I had ever made in my life, I had no skills to make a good meal that was affordable. And I regretted that I hadn't taken at least some home economics. And it wasn't until I was 45 years old that I was with my sister who was visiting and I was making something in the kitchen having to do with flour and I would, the kitchen is not my place, just let, oh. And I was sifting flour and I spilled something and then I went through the process of mopping it up like you always did and my sister said, what on earth are you doing? And I said, what, what do you mean? She said, you're sifting flour. Yes, yes, I'm sifting and we're not doing that right. This is mom's old sifter. Um, and she said, well, you always should sift flour over the sink then you just wash it down the drain. So I would have learned these things had I taken home economics. But I did learn one thing, and that's how to sew. Uh, and I didn't learn it in home economics, I actually learned it from my sisters who tutored me. And I have to tell you that this is one of the best skills that I ever learned because I love sailing. Uh, and this is a hatch cover for our sailboat that I made a weekend ago. Uh, and I was able to deconstruct the old one, figure out that they used Dacron tape and nylon, uh, how they stitched it together. I made the pattern and created this in a couple hours. Uh, I thought this was the easier project. This panel is a sail that attaches to our boom cover uh, and creates a sunshade over the boat, reducing the temperature in the cockpit when we're at the dock by about 10 degrees. We've been using a tent fly for that task, and while that works really well, we get some really funny looks from folks at the Yacht Club. <laughs> well, what Dreilinger will tell all of us is home economics is really about science. It's really about engineering. It's really about economics. It's really about people who have said, I see a problem in the world, and I want to figure out how to fix it. Well, folks, I've been working at an organization that tries to inspire people by a woman who had exactly that approach to everything in life. And so when I was asked to review this book, I knew that I didn't have a personal relationship with home economics, but I did know enough about Susan B. Anthony to know how significant the development of the home economics field had been in the 19th century and, and still to today. But oh, was this a fun read. One of the things I like best about the book is from the very beginning, it has a 2021 approach. She's looking not just at some of the women whose names you would know, 
but looking at the black women whose names you should know. And throughout the whole book, she's talking about those tensions. Uh, I'll give you my personal thesis about reformed movements. They begin when somebody sees something that needs to be changed. And some very visionary people who want to improve society get engaged thinking that they can change the world if they'll just wake some people up to the situation. Initially, the status quo pushes back. And they push back by discrediting the idea. They rule it out. They attack the leaders. They do everything they can do to undermine this movement that might upset the status quo. But these movements persist because these are good ideas. These are just ideas. And they build support over time, at which point the status quo then co-ops the movement, calls it their own, adapts it, and modifies it for purposes for which it is not intended. If I were thinking about women's suffrage, I can think about the ways that those ultraists or the radicals like Susan B. Anthony and Frederick Douglass, who believe that every person must be able to elect our government or we could never be of the people, by the people, or for the people. But now we look at suffrage history by the late 19th century when the KKK saw the women's suffrage movement as a way to tell people if we give black women the right to vote, it will turn upside down the culture in Jim Crow Southern America. And so some of the strongest, most strident suffragists for white women's vote were people who were racist and white supremacists. That's the example for me. Similarly, with home economics, you have the ideas that are groundbreaking, that get ridiculed, and you have the champions, and then you have the status quo that adopts it, changes it, uses it for other purposes, and then the final stage that I think of as in that life cycle of social reform movements is when the movement eats its own. When the people within the movement critique the movement to the extent that it ceases to be successful. For me, that was the 1970s Robin Morgan era and the feminist mystique that said, well, stop teaching little girls that they were supposed to grow up and become homemakers. Everything about home economics is about being sexist and gender roles and traps people where they shouldn't be. And so we lost the power of the radical movement that home economics really is. But you can learn all about that right in this book. Now, I don't know enough about, 19, about 20th century history to tell you whether or not her academic work is sound. Um, but I believe it's well footnoted and that she really does draw on good sources. I can tell you she's very thorough in that she does draw in uh, some, some amazing sources and stories. And I also know it's entertaining. It does not read like a history book, which of course they're wonderful and valuable, but can be a little dry. This one's a, a fun read. Every chapter is interesting. The other is that every chapter focuses on what was the impact of home economics. When she begins, she talks to us a little bit about who were these people who were specializing initially in domestic science. And she focuses on three characters. Some of you are familiar with the Beechers. Uh, if you, you know, read uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, then you know the sister of the Beecher, who's featured in this book, who was a domestic scientist. Most of you are familiar with Booker T. Washington. But did you know his third wife, who is one of the founders of the science of home economics and who taught it at the Tuskegee Institute until, and so that they had a program that was nationally famous? And you need to know the name of Ellen Richards. And when I, because I was reading the book, knowing I was going to be reviewing it, at first I thought, oh, I'm going to pull out all the characters and have those in the slideshow. But there were too many, and I would have lost you. I lost me in it. Uh, but you want to remember those three, because from the very beginning in the domestic science, we actually have a tension between black culture, which was coming out of the Civil War and is learning how to produce families and situations and address issues like hunger and starvation and dealing with systems like sharecropping, uh, to the young white women who are beginning to have some time on their hands, some flexible time, but who are fed up with pandemics and cholera and sanitation issues and 
public edu education problems that can be solved by learning more and implementing procedures and practices that can save lives and improve society. From the very beginning, it was both a black women's movement and a white women's movement, but it gets suppressed in terms of the directions that it goes. Now, one of the things that uh, Drylinger outlines in the first chapter, she says there were six, excuse me, five core tensions as we look at the history of home economics that we wanna focus on. The first was, was the backbone of home economics, moral, scientific, or both? Second, would it serve rural areas and farms, or would it serve urban areas and cities? Third, was its purpose practical or intellectual? Did you come here to learn how to sew or to talk about sewing? Fourth, would black colleges or MIT, which had the groundbreaking program for home economics for more than 60 years, take the lead? Five, was a curriculum that focused on the household empowering for women or regressive and anti-feminist anti -sex and sexist? Uh, she takes those five tensions and builds the story over the course of all of the chapters, uh, which it makes it so incredibly relevant. It's amazing when she wraps up the book and she's talking about where we are right now with the pandemic. It couldn't be more timely to be thinking about this book. But I wanted to pull out some of the stories that may interest some of you about the role of home economics. The woman who got MIT interested in taking on home economics, uh, these are very significant roles and processes. The initial people were engineers and scientists. It's also very interesting, there's a whole lot of lesbians in the early group. Um, women who were cohabitating, who had a certain amount of freedom to pursue academic work, as well as work outside of the home because they were not staying home and doing all of the things that they'd been told they were supposed to do. So the people who actually championed home economics in the earlier era were incredibly feminist if you looked at them from that 1970s viewpoint. They believed that the whole point to improving what you could do in the home, making it more efficient, making it easier, was so that women or men would not get bogged down in the drudgery and the repetition to bring in tools, to bring in resources, so that you had freedom to do the creative work that could really change the world. Now, I was very surprised to find out that that was the initial, because you know, I did have this bias about home economics from the very beginning. I suspect some of you um, don't have that bias from the beginning. Because did you know it was determined early on in World War I that food was gonna be the way to win the war? Dietitians, nutritionists, that's a home economics skill and an approach. And what they realized was most of the men who were called up to war failed in terms of having bodies strong enough to go to war. And the issue in rural America was nutrition. So the home economics folks went to work at thinking about how do we improve the diet? How do we improve nutrition? How do we address this issue that across America, particularly in rural areas, and I have to remember, I think it's 19, uh, 30 before most, before even a majority of farms in America have electricity. Um, so issues of sanitation are affecting health, issues of um, food and what do people have. So it was these women, these home economists who went to the federal government and said, we can improve the ability of the American army to fight in World War I through diet. Through, through diet. And so they developed canning systems they de develop ways to preserve food. There was a whole issue around the, um, the government seized some pork because there was been too much pork and it turned out to be a disaster because they oversalted it and more of the food was ruined uh, than saved. And in stepped the home, home economists who said, we can use science. And the American forces were determined to have the best nutrition of any of the other forces fighting in Europe. We set the standard. And it was because of the science of home economics. But there was a controversy 
because the t couple thousand dietitians, many of whom were women, who were establishing their career and changing the world by sustaining the American forces, could not get commissioned. And after the war, despite the fact that it was recognized that we probably couldn't have fought as well and won, had it not been for those dietitians, not a single one was given status so that they could get any benefits from the United States Army. But food, as we know, is what would help to win the war uh, in the 19, in the, uh, from 1918 to 1921. Now, the, excuse me, 1914 to 1918. Now, around the same time, uh, there was a group of folks in Lake Placid. Uh, the leader was a woman named Annie Dewey. You may, anybody know Annie Dewey? Anybody checked out a book from the library? You know her husband of the Dewey Decimal System. So they had a place up in Lake Placid. It was a resort community. And Annie had to learn all about hospitality and preparing foods for a lot of people. Um, her husband, you might not know, um, wouldn't have fared well in the Me Too time because he was known for having an eye and a hand with younger women. Uh, quite scandalous at the time, and yet she stayed with him, uh, but they were the people who started the Lake Placid Conference. And initially they brought in 10 home economists, including Beecher and Richards, uh, and, and they did not, however, invite Mrs. Washington to come to that, despite the fact that she had the best program, and black colleges were all developing significant programs in e home economics. They were still calling it domestic sciences. So when you're looking in the early 20th century, if it's domestic science, it's probably coming out of black colleges, which have a priority on supporting families. If it's home economics, it's the folks up in Lake Placid who are developing it. So first they tried to define what, what is this uh, science all about? Well, they pretty soon get aligned with the eugenicists. The eugenicists who believe that if Darwinian ideas, if we could stop people from having children who don't have the best genes, we can improve society. Uh, it was quite a movement. Now, I, if I look at that from the 19th century perspective, I have a better understanding. In the 19th century, if you had a child uh, who had a disability, uh, there was no social security system um, there was no economic support system. Uh, often, in Susan B. Anthony's era, a child who was born with any kind of perceived, uh, I never want to be, I'm not comfortable with the language that you would have used in the 19th century. Often, uh, the family would have engaged in infanticide because the idea was that the child would never be able to support themselves and would never have a life that would be tolerable and that they would go through suffering. Uh, now, if you have a culture that sees children who might have a disability as a problem, uh, you can understand the eugenic model is better. Well, just if we could prevent those children from ever being born, we prevent the horrors of infanticide. Uh, but now we have a different culture that sees every human being as differently abled and can see the benefits and it's horrific to think about it. Uh, but those folks up at Lake Placid got pretty closely aligned with some of the eugenicists. Uh, talking about birth control, but strategic birth control. Which, gosh, at some point that appealed to those southern white supremacists of if we could just purify the whole race. And so eugenics, which was originally about a science of using the DNA, which they didn't really understand yet, but, but using gene determinants to suggest you had a better chance of having more children survive to adulthood if you thought first about the gene pool, um, became a, we can manipulate the gene pool to have more people look like me instead of people who look like somebody I perceive to be the other. Somehow, home economics gets caught up in that whole mess just when they're really launching the field and the profession. Uh, Richards, 
who I mentioned, Ellen Richards. Now, Ellen Richards actually lives almost from the beginning of the book to the end of the book. Uh, so she's a name that keeps popping up a lot. In fact, one of the last chapters is, what would Ellen do? And they don't mean Ellen DeGeneres. Uh, and which I thought maybe we would get to Ellen DeGeneres, but it wasn't. It was, what would Ellen do? Uh, and it's because Ellen Richards always had that understanding that the point was to make society better. Unfortunately, although Ellen didn't really engage with the eugenicists, neither did she disparage them. Uh, and so it's really not clear. Uh, and it's interesting, I, I wish she had um, clearly defined when she thought it might be a useful science and when it was not a useful science. Because it becomes a, a significant factor in how racism develops in the home economics movement uh, around that idea of some people are better than others and we want more of them uh, instead of less of them. What happens then um, shortly after World War, or just before World War I, excuse me, is the focus becomes on the farm because it, that's perceived that that's where the problem is. That's where most of the men who were being called up who had malnutrition were coming from. The farm is the breadbasket of, uh, of, of the world. And during World War I, people began to ration food. Uh, they rationed food, they rationed textiles, they rationed gasoline. And so the way that you would support the war off effort was to learn how to manage on less. Uh, I now understand my mother better than I did because I think she grew up with this idea that you should never waste any food. It's a part of our society's responsibility to share but not to overeat, not to overindulge. And then now, of course, we're a society that's notorious for the food that we throw away and the food that we waste. Well, back in the early 20th century, there were folks called home demonstration agents. And the federal government hired the home demonstration agents and sent them out to farm communities. And these were home economists. Um, and they would explain things, particularly around sanitation, around uh, figuring out, figuring out things. They also helped to invent some of the best things, like the original washing machine that you would put the suds and the soap into. And then you would get a bucket, and you would pour the soap and the suds into a bucket, and you would haul the bucket out to dump it until one home economist said, why don't we put a drain in the bottom of the sewing machine and a pipe that takes the water out. And then you didn't have to carry six gallons of dirty, filthy water out to some place to dump it in the bushes, because all you had to do was open the valve at the bottom of the bucket and let the water go. Some of the most amazing things that were invented that we take so for granted now are because of home economics and because of those people who thought, we can, we can eliminate the drudgery. Uh, when they had a contest between the electric iron and the old iron from the stove, it was hands down the electric iron, <laughs> the electric iron won. It was more consistent, it was faster, and it was actually a lot less dangerous, uh, especially now that if it tips over, it turns itself off. But, um, so the home uh, demonstration agents were a part of the federal program and they were sent all out. And these were many of the people who became involved during World War I but then who after the war were not given any reward or commission or any respect for the tremendous work that they did. The US Food Administration actually invented a thing called the Hoover Apron uh, that the, the um, home people went out to. And the Council for National Defense instituted the Women's Committee to recruit volunteers, to distribute packets of seeds, to teach people how to plant, how to nurture, how to weed, uh, and as a part of this, we have the beginnings of what later is the Consumer Protection Agency, which is born out of home economics. The idea that now corporations are creating things which may or may not be good for our health. This is from home economics, which is one of the reasons why there were some people who had vested interest in discrediting home economics. It's just something to take girls to in the class because Gosh, it's the home economists who are looking at things like, what's the impact on the body of pesticides, DDT, Roundup? Uh, what is the significance of corn syrup in the diet? What does that do to nutrition? Better to discredit the organization. Um, there's a couple who work at Cornell. Cornell, of course, was a cooperative extension, and the book will tell you about how all that gets started. And they begin to address issues uh, around home economics. They happen to be a couple. So Flora Rose and Mrs. Van Rensselaer, uh, Miss Van Rensselaer, excuse me, 
who are such a couple, so well known, that people just refer to them as Miss Van Rose. Um, and they're about 10 years apart, and they teach and are at the top of their field at Cornell for years. And they are significant movers and shakers. And have you ever heard of them? No, right. See, there's, you've got to read the book, is what I'm telling you. Um, well, one of the things that we get to in the book is it, it moves from how the approach to providing excellent nutrition during World War I was a huge factor, and also getting the American society to support the war movement by adjusting its uh, home uses as well. We move into World War II. And in World War II, at first, some of those home economists, like Ellen Richards and Miss Van Rose, don't want to get involved in World War II because they were so stung from last time when their brains and their engineering skills were used, but they got no credit or pay for doing it. Uh, one of the things that, um, that they raise right away is there's huge starvation hitting the foreign troops. Um, people are dying right and left. And of course, the, the food supply is being annihilated along with the people uh, in Europe. And so the home economics people begin devote themselves working side by side with nurses to provide sanitation and improvement and end up being commissioned and sent out in World War II, but where the ratio is horrific. Um, one dietitian for every 2,000 ar uh, army personnel. And they end up in places like in the Philippines. Uh, in the Philippines, there's one dietitian who's there, uh, and it, if you know much about the Philippines, they end up um, with about 4,000 people in camps. This is before um, the March from Bataan, uh, but it's horrific situations and they're doing their best. At one point, the dietitians, because there's such a shortage of good food, everyone is rationed to 700 calories a day. Um, but by doing that science, they're sustaining more lives uh, and keeping more people alive with this horrific nutrition. Um, and at the time that the Japanese come and start the Bataan March, um, and the um, the women who had been the dietitians along with the nurses were not taken to the prison camp. Uh, but were instead interred differently. Um, and then they're caring for the other people who are in the camps. Um, and as one said, it was so difficult, the agony to see patients dying of starvation. Um, but they learned more things. And they developed a different vision, which was about that home economics wasn't just about changing how America in its farms and cities addresses issues of deserts of food, but how the world could come together to solve issues of starvation and hunger. And they're doing it in the you know, 1940s. Um, the uh, Japanese actually put the military women in an internment camp in Manila, uh, where they were neglected, as they said, rather than tortured, as the other prisoners of war would. So these, these women and men are heroes who are courageously bringing the skill set that they have to consistently try to change the world and make it a better place. So I, they align really well with those women who were on Madison Street for me. At, uh, during the Civil, excuse me, during the, the um, World War II, I sorry that I get stuck back in the 19th century. Thank you. But during World War II, we see a division between the folks who are doing home economics for business and those who are doing home economics in terms of family life. And the business is the most threatening, right? But it's also the most lucrative. Because if a woman can demonstrate to Westinghouse or J.C. Penney or uh, one of the, the manufacturers of, this is a Bernina, little brother, um, that they can make a better sewing machine that's going to sell better, then they're going to get better paid as an engineer to do that, as opposed to the women who are teaching in high schools uh, and grade schools and who are trying to improve. And then we also see the division already in the 40s of, is it a moral issue? You must teach women to do and to love the stuff at home because it's a family value. Or is it about if we take women and men who have skills like science and engineering and we put them into the field where they can most excel, that's going to benefit all of us. And so there's a tension among the movement between those two groups. 
Now I'm going to jump a little, actually I'm going to jump quite a bit ahead to you, um, all the way almost to the current date because uh, it's just really dense and fun, but we're running out of time. Um, and I want to take you to the chapter that she calls uh, Home Economics at Risk because this focuses in on, on my era. Um, it, and it focuses in uh, on a number of the people. One of the people you'll want to know is Flemmie Kittrell. Um, Flemmie Kittrell, who actually started out her career uh, and at, um, well, she ends up at Howard University um, in the mid-70s, still continuing to change things and, and pushing out for um, home economics in black colleges. Um, then there's another person who is Louise Ann Mamer, who was one of the rural electrification administration administrations. Now, who thought about home economics bringing electricity to houses? It's, it's those people. Those were the ones who advocated back in an era when so much of the United States had no access to electricity, which they saw as a health issue as well as an empowerment issue. Gosh, if you could give a woman a plug, she could do a whole lot of things that she had to spend a lot of hours doing uh, in the meantime. But then there's the other piece. When we have things, now I have to confess, I did not borrow one of these sewing machines to make this heavy duty canvas and go through 10 layers. I actually bought an obscenely expensive sail right machine because it can go through all the layers and do everything that I want to do and because I have privilege and I could spend five years waiting for it to go on sale and the price went up. <laughs> so I, I bought the thing. Sewing is an amazing industry if we track home economics because initially one of the ideas was it was supposed to free women from the drudgery of hand sewing and assembling. But as Susan B. Anthony would tell you at the end of the 19th century, what was supposed to free women became a tremendous burden of having to do piecework at home on top of doing all of the care of the house and the child so that they could bring in the dollars to support their family. And so what was supposed to be a tool for freedom becomes a tool of oppression, which is one of the tensions that we hear. Now for me, okay, there's nothing better than the boat and making things for the boat, but I have to tell you, every video that I watch about boat canvas, ha there are no women sewing at the big heavy machine. Uh, they call it portable, it weighs half of what I weigh. All the men are making the canvas on all the videos, and they're doing it outside, like they're out by the dock, or they're out by the boat. This is man's work over here, and fortunately, I can do it. So she raises the question about is home economics really at risk? And I guess if my workers don't even know what the term means, it probably is. But she tracks one of the greatest risks uh, back to the Nation at Risk report. Um, and it was the report that really has had significant impact on us in the last 30 years. Uh, it's the 1983 report. And the ringing declaration, I'm gonna read you the quote. The educational foundations of our society are presently being eroded by a rising tide of mediocrity that threatens our very future as a nation and as a people. Well, the Nation at Risk presidential report, of course, eventually feeds into uh, the schools and No Child Left Behind and testing. And as schools started to test more on math mathematics and reading, there was less room in the curriculum for things like home economics and teaching about the science of nutrition or about uh, from dietitian standpoint as well. So this is one of the great challenges that's represented by the home economics movement, which is what is education about? Are we educating people to have a job or are we educating people to change the world? And what's the vision that we're going to empower them for? In many schools, the time spent learning how to cook and drive counts as much toward a high school diploma as the time spent studying mathematics. I would like to see some people spend some more time learning how to drive <laughs> in schools um, and, and, and to cook. And one thing that the pandemic's done is to help us with that. But we still have so many people who don't even know how to access good food and how to put it into an affordable meal in our society. Uh, and so that's the challenge that she has. Um, Another thing that was a, a big movement of the home economists was daycare. Because then again, the idea is if you could make it better and children could be raised better and you could support women, then they could be free to do things that could change the world. 
Not that raising children doesn't change the world. It absolutely does. Uh, but guess who then went after the home economists? Phyllis Shafley. Oh, oh my goodness. The struggle between the Judeo-Christian ethic based on God-given eternal law and the secular humanist orthodoxy. They branded the home economists as secular humanism. It talks all about teaching people how to, to learn about birth control, learn about sex education, learn about nutrition, learn about societal structures, and that's anti-God. Uh, so at that point, for Phyllis Shafley, I would suggest that home economics looked like a terrifying progressive reform that had the potential to change society, which right there just would really interest me in it from day one in getting involved. The plaintiffs in a national case charged that the books, meaning the four books, which were textbooks on home economics that were on the list of 22 books that Shafley and crew wanted banned from schools, home economics books, unconstitutionally established the religion of secular humanism. And so it gave no reason to believe in God, and so they should be thrown out and removed. And as you know, we are still fighting the banned books uh, fight today. Um, the emphasis on careers is one of the reasons that people attack the home economics books. Um, and if we seriously value the work that makes our lives easier, in some cases makes people able to work outside the home, then we might improve the way of those who did it. Um, remember, I talked about the chapter, What Would Ellen Do? Um, she uses a quote in here wh that what Ellen said about everything that she pushed forward that she saw as home economics was, if we could do this, we could change the world. Now, I think the book I highly recommend and I'm, uh, that she creates is mistitled because she says the secret history of home economics. Okay, yes, there's a secret history of home economics. I, that's true. There's a secret history of almost everything. Now we're learning. How trailblazing women, absolutely, harness the power of home and change the way we live. That is such a true statement. However, Susan B. Anthony published The History of Woman Suffrage in the 19th century. She and Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Matilda Charles Engage. And then they self-published it and they sent it out across the country because they believed in three verbs. Agitate, educate, and organize. I think that this is actually a call to action and it calls us to educate ourselves about the home economics movement, about where we could benefit it from it and where the work is not yet done, to agitate because a whole bunch of people have written it off and unfortunately that's where some of the status quo is, is winning, and then to organize because these women from the 19th century and the 20th century had a vision that we could accomplish. Thank you.